So, uh, the other day I uploaded uh, a video, kind of an updated video on why I'm a fan of the Lustful Milk Gag. And, you know, I, I talked about, you know, the various, you know, uh, times that I saw the gag, the trope, if you will, uh, showcased. And I figured, you know, why not kind of talk about what I would consider, and I don't know if I've done a countdown of this or not, if I have. I guess you consider this an update too, but I wanted to come on here and kind of, I guess you could say mention my, I would say, top five favorites and the reason as to why my top five favorites. So um, without further ado, let's uh, let's get into it, shall we? So number five, uh, believe it or not, is actually from Europe in 30 minutes. It is Babs doing the lustful milk egg, but she does it out of admiration, um, as an awe of being in the presence of royalty. And as I mentioned in the in the video the other day, the way this happens is they're in Europe because Plucky uh, won a trip on a game show, and. You know, when they get into the royal palace, Buckingham Palace, if you will, you know, they're trying to find a place to, to hide so they don't get caught or anything like that. And uh, what happens is they hide um, near this um, suit of armor. And the moment they see the royal couple walk by, Babs kind of, you know, follows suit. Like she comes, you know, she, uh, you know, basically jumps off the royal, or jumps off the back of the the suit of armor, and she follows suit just a little bit, and she sighs, says her word, uh, says the line, "Ah, royalty," and then literally you see this like little transition of her melting, and you can kind of tell that like this was an early. You know, early version of it, even though they kind of showed, you know, Buster doing it uh, in Looney Beginning and everything. But this was more like, you know, a, like this was like the first full-on, okay, you know, we're gonna, you know, do some kind of lustful milk game, okay, but you know, we still need practice. We still need uh, time with it, and you kind of see that practice and time pay off in later um, uh, episodes and everything. But it's here where basically. Uh, basically, she ends up melting down into a puddle, you know, in admiration, in awe of being in the presence of royalty. But what puts it at number five as well is it's also the first time something else happens. And what happens is, as, as I mentioned in the video, she ends up getting run through. Yeah. Basically, what happens is after she melts, Buster, Plucky, and Hampton, they run, you know, they run, they kind of follow suit. Don't melt. They don't melt or anything, but they follow suit by running after the royal couple, couple down the hall. And the moment they're completely, like, gone from sight, like, you know, all three of them are out of the picture, that's when Babs reforms and basically follows suit. She follows quickly, you know, right after them. But... The reason, again, I put this at five is because it's the first time ever, uh, period, that we see this kind of, um, this, I guess you could say this, this uh, situation happen to where a character is melted to the point that basically the compadres, the friends, run right through them and cause them to splash all over uh, the area, like little bits of pieces of them splashing all over uh, the hallway of Buckingham Palace before they eventually reform. So that's why it's at number five. But if it's not number five, what's at number four? Number four has to be Sooner Crooner. And the reason Sooner Crooner is um, a scene where the black and brown hen melts and everything is because it, you know, it's like basically it's a reaction. You never really see any of the uh, cartoons, whether the Warner Brothers, MJM, or any of them at that time that would do characterizations of, you know, parody characterizations of, you know, celebrities like Frank Sinatra or Bing Cosby and all that. You know, it's one of those situations to where it's a, a reaction you don't normally see, and yet it happens in Sooner Crooner, because basically you have this hen um, call out his name, call out Frank Sinatra's name, or the rooster that's playing Frank Sinatra, and she literally just sighs then, and, you know, after she calls out his name, she sighs, kind of leans back a little bit, and just goes straight down 
you know, into a quivering puddle of, of black goo with only her little frill, I, as I've mentioned before, on the top. But what's interesting about it, like I said, is she goes down and basically becomes a quivering puddle of melt, melted goo. Um, and almost very reminiscing of when you crack an egg and you put the egg in a stove and all you have is like the yolk on the top. That's, that's what it kind of reminds me of. And what I like about it is essentially... Uh, it's implied that she, uh, along with the other hens, remain in the state of, you know, passed outness, faintness, you know, just overwhelmed with, I guess you could say, um, love and arousement, if you will, uh, of the Frank Sinatra rooster singing to them. You know, that, you know, it's implied that she remains that way until you get this Bing Cosby-like pigeon come in and basically his singing uh, basically, bring, uh, basically brings all the, the hens back to life or basically, ref, you know, restores them or in this case of the black and brown hen, reforms her and all that. So that's kind of why it's at number f four because of its unique uniqueness in that manner of it's implied that if Porky didn't get this uh, Bing Cosby like pigeon to to come in and kind of do singing himself that she would have probably remained that way for who knows how long but you know that's why it's at number five, uh, number four but if it's not number four what's at number three well at number three is meet Minerva that's right, Meet Minerva's Meltdown. Because, you know, first of all, production-wise, this was supposed to be the first solo cartoon featuring her. But because of production issues, uh, it ended up being the second one. But the reason I put this one at number three is because mainly the fact that she melts down into a puddle. But she literally does what uh, a lot of the uh, sayings go, those tropes and sayings go of you know, melting through the hands and all that. She literally does that when she meets her friend's uh, cousin uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the cartoon. She literally does that. It's like after she sees him, does a wild take and all that, she runs towards him and you will right into his arms, leans back, sighs, and then melts. But again, as I mentioned in the video, uh, she doesn't melt like, you know, right, you know, right down, you know, through, through his hands, like, you know, straight down the middle you know, of, of his hands, you know, when he's holding her. No, she melts by literally splitting in half. That's right. One, like her upper half goes, you know, goes down the right side, kind of melts off his, you know, his uh, right side of his, of his body, basically his right, his right arm or left arm that he's holding her in. Her upper body goes one way and then her lower body goes the other way and they meet right in the middle where all that's left is just her, uh, as a white melted puddle with her um, eyes closed and everything. You get like a little bit of a smile, but not much uh, there before she reforms into an obnoxious boat horn. And, uh, and the reason this is at number three is because of that reason, for the fact that she does the gag. You know, she does the gag in everything. Um, she does the love for milk gag and, and all that, but... The way she does it is unique because she literally splits in half when she does it and meets right, you know, on the ground, you know, and, and because, you know, and, and she basically meet, she basically splits in half and meets herself basically back together as one puddle on the ground before she reforms. So that's why I put this at, you know, at number three because of that unique factor of she went one, it's like bottom half goes one way, the upper half goes the other way, and they just meet all together in the middle, you know, as one big white puddle. So that's why it's at number three. That's why the Meet Minerva Lustful Melt is at number three, but then what's at number two? Number two, believe it or not, comes from Palais Vu's Woo, Palais Vu's Woo's, the 1956 Popeye short, the one that kind of got me into being a fan, and that is when olive oil at the end melts into a running puddle of butter on the floor. I mean, literally, that's what she does. She basically gets kissed on the hand by Popeye after he eats a second dose of spinach and basically becomes his own version of the International, which is a play, a parody of the Intercontinental uh, persona um, that was on television back in that time frame. Uh, he dons a tuxedo, kisses her on the hand, she turns red, her entire body turns red, and her, her face literally, you know, she's turning red, her face basically gets big, it gets like, it starts to blow up a little bit, kind of like, 
like a balloon, and then all of a sudden you see all the steam coming out of her ears and all that. And then she tells Popeye that, you know, she kind of sighs, and she tells Popeye, you know, that she's just like butter in his hands. And she literally, as she's saying this, melts right into a running puddle of butter, which kind of like takes Popeye a second to, to kind of register, and then he gets a kick out of it, and all that starts laughing. Because, you know, the one, the one thing about... Um, the one thing about the uh, the short is that everything that gets talked about, you know, around Olive and all that actually happens. It does. Like at the beginning, the International tells the girls, like Olive who's watching, that their eyes are like limpet pools. And her eyes literally become like limpet pools, literally, and everything. So you get all these kind of things that, you know, get talked about and everything literally happening to her, either at the behest of somebody else saying it or, you know, herself saying it. In this case, she says it to the point that when she says it, she literally becomes a running puddle of melted butter, you know, on the floor that just runs down the floor and everything. And Popeye, like I said, takes a second to, you know, register it because it kind of surprises him, catches him off guard. But, you know, he starts laughing because she, what she literally says happen, or, or what she literally says she feels like happens to her. And what's unique about this is that she's running down the floor as a, pu- as a mel- as melted butter. Again, you see her face on there. It's like a smile. Her eyes and her smile and everything is on, on the puddle as she's flowing down the floor. But what's interesting is she's flowing down the floor. You see, like, these little dry spots start to appear. Now, you do see the dry spots appear, like, when she's starting to melt and everything, and, you know, and all that. You know, you start to see it appear. She's starting to melt down. But as soon as, like, she's completely melted and she's flowing down the floor... You know, you start seeing these little dry spots start to appear in the upper part of her melted form, even towards where her face is. And if you pause, if you pause uh, the short at the exact moment, whether you have the, whether you have a DVD with it on there, or you pause the YouTube presentation of it, if you pause it at the exact moment, she, you could literally see one of the dry spots. I'm not joking about this. See, one of the dry spots right near her eye. Like, it literally touches her eye to the point that it feels like it's going to dry up her eye and everything, but it doesn't. It just, you know, she just continues to flow down. But, yeah, that's kind of a unique portion of it. Well, not a unique portion, but a unique thing I like about it is the fact that you see that kind of a, you know, situation happen to where as the character that's melted is flowing down the floor, you see these little dry spots just suddenly appear on them and literally, you know, appear in places to where you're thinking, well, if if Popeye doesn't do something, she's just literally going to melt completely uh, down into, into a complete puddle and then dry up kind of deal. And that's kind of like, And that's kind of the vibe you get here. It's like, of course, you know, Popeye's going to probably, you know, laugh about it and then keep laughing, walk over to her, scoop her up with a a cup and then pour her back to normal like we pretty much can picture he would. But, um, but yeah, it's uh, literally, like I said, literally, if you pause it at, you know, a precise moment, you get... You get to see exactly what I'm talking about and everything. And that's kind of the unique factor here, too, is when you see the character do this and all that, it, it's not just the fact that you see them, fl- you know, you see dry spots appearing on their puddled form, you know, as they're a puddle, but you see them flowing down the floor. And you see them, like I said, with a big old smile on the face, because, you know, at the fact that, hey, they're now just, you know, exactly what they said they are, the melted butler, and they're just flowing down the floor in happiness, you know, not even registering, you know, the fact that, they're gonna, that they got certain dry spots appearing around them and all that, because they're just, you know, a melted puddle of butter. That's about it. But that's why it's at number two, not just because of those unique factors, but also because it kind of got me into being a fan of the gag. But then what's number one? What is the number one? Well, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to know what number one is. Number one, to me, is Moon over Minerva. And, of course, I'm talking about when Minerva melts in front of Wilfred Wolf when he's in his Fabio werewolf form. I mean, seriously, this is just one of the funniest meltdowns, you know, of versions of the trope I've ever, I have seen. It is. It really is. Because not only does she um, see his Fabio form for the second time and go, Yahoo, my man, and then just stand up straight and then melt down. No. It's the way it, the way the meltdown happens or how it kind of 
I guess you could say concurs with Wilford doing it earlier in the short because when he does it, you know, you're thinking, okay, he's just going to be a blue and gray puddle with his glasses on top of him. No, he's literally still able to talk. I mean, he basically says he can't feel his legs. Here, what makes this so unique is when she does it, she literally melts down completely, and he has to, as I mentioned previously in a video, he has to pick her up like a wet towel. Parts of her is now dripping off, off, off of her, basically dripping off a melted form. He has to pick her up like a wet towel, with, you know, like I said, parts of her dripping off onto the ground, and wring her out like a wet towel just to reform her. You know, that's how far gone she was, to the point that he had to do that, because as I mentioned in the video previously, and I'll mention here, if, they, if Wilford wanted to, he could have easily walked off, gone taking a show, got some dinner, maybe do a bit of shopping, whatever, have a smoke, and he could come back two hours, three hours later, and she'd still be lying there as a melted puddle of goop. You know, that's how far far gone she was to the point that when he has to the point that he has to pick her up, wring her out, and restore her in that manner like she's a wet towel. And like I mentioned with the Palais Vaux uh, meltdown situation, if you have the DVD of Animaniacs with that episode on there, and you pause it and you go step by step with it when he's kind of like picking her up and restoring her, when he starts to wring her out and everything. And you, you, you go basically step by step with it. As soon as he starts wringing her out and then you kind of see her get back, or get back to the port part that she's getting restored, you know, the way her face is, the way her look is, after, you know, as he's restoring her, or at least as he flaps, you know, kind of like, you know, flaps her down a little bit to kind of get her back to normal, like a wet, like, you know, somebody would do a wet towel to dry it or get, get out the unnecessary uh, wetness. Um, basically, her face and everything, you know, her eyes are all like, like, like she doesn't even know where she's at anymore. Cause she, cause basically her, her doing the, her, her version of the meltdown in this completely took her out of it. It's like, you know, basically he has to ring her out just to restore her. And then her look is like, you do. like she doesn't even know, you know, where she's at. Like she's just coming to now. And as I've mentioned before, somebody who posed as Minerva on Facebook and would always give people like, you know, fan of the week or fan of the month or whatever, you know, when they were asked about it uh, themselves, I think I may have asked that fan posing as Minerva this question. Uh, when, I, when I asked about it and others kind of followed suit, they did say it was the equivalent of taking a nap, basically going to sleep, if you will. Because, again, he has to restore her, wake her up, if you will, by wringing her out like a towel. And that's just why it's number one. Because, because first of all, you know, it's contracting. In con it's kind of contracting what Wilford did when he did it because he was still able to talk. Here, he has to literally, in his Fabio form, pick her up like a f wet towel and dry her out, out and everything to get rid of the, ex the access of uh, dampness or wetness uh, that, her pu that her puddle form is, has created and everything. She literally has to do that. And what's also unique about it, too, is, uh, like I said, if you go and kind of do step-by-step, -step, you know, uh, watching on it, slow motion, if you will, when she melts down, you see, like, little pieces of her kind of, like, falling off, and then when she finally gets to her melt complete melted form, you see, like, a little piece of her um, hair that's melted now in the back of her, like, separate, and then, like, I see a little piece of her uh, pink dress separate as well away from her and that kind of gives you the indication like yep she's completely out she's done <laughs> you know and, and it's so funny because of the fact that literally he had like I said literally you know he could have walked off for like s three four hours come back and she'd still be that way that's how it was presented and that's why it is my top favorite uh, Les Phil Melt uh, gag to be done by a character in any, uh, in the history, I should say, of the gag period. But let me know what your guys' thoughts were. What are your top favorites? Do you think I was right in the order I came up with? Or what's your order? Let me know down below in the comments, as well as in the live chat during the premiere. Like the video. Click on the upper left-hand corner to check out my Teespring store. Also, you will get a, uh, you will also get a audio podcast version of this at BW Roses, or BW Roses, 
uh, discussions at all your favorite audio podcast locations except for Pandora. Also support me at Venmo at Brian Dash Warmer Dash Two, Cash App at VW Roses ninety eight. Also DeviantArt dot com says BVW nineteen seventy nine. Check me out at Vimo at BW Roses for content you can't get here on YouTube, and at Patreon dot com says BW Roses for the one dollar or three dollar tier. But guys, let me know what your thoughts are. What are your Top five, if you will, when it comes to this gag. Do you think I got some right? Do you think I got them wrong? Let me know down below. Don't be shy. You know, let us know what your favorites are. Do you agree? Do you not? Let me know down below. And until next time, I am out. <laughs>